Hello everyone, my name is Rich, and you are watching a, a live panel right now, if you happen to be on Google+, uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, it's not live anymore. But this is a panel that is held as part of the December Game Night, Pound Game Night, which is part of Indie Plus, which is a Google uh, community that we, we talk about tabletop role-playing games. And uh, this panel specifically is about holidays, um, and we're talking about holidays in games and with gamers. This panel will adhere to the community standards of the Indie Plus group. Um, and if you want to know more about that, feel free to check out the Indie Plus uh, webpage, which we'll have posted in the YouTube notes. So what is this uh, little panel that we're going to talk about? I'll talk about that, and then I'll bring our guests on. Christmas, Yom Kippur, Guy Fox Night, I, Memorial Day, May Day, the list of festivals and holidays around the globe is endless. And each are as distinct as the culture which celebrates them. So how do holidays and festivals fit in your game world? How can game masters use them as plot hooks and adventures? We have a number of questions, uh, and also we have the question answered live. So if you're watching us right now and you want to give us a question, we will do our best to answer it. So let me bring our wonderful panelists on. I'll start from my left to right uh, with Epidia Ravishal. I hear Epi's a bit of a game designer, author, and over-editor of the <laughs> e-zine Worlds Without Master. How are you doing, Epi? I'm doing well. I'm doing very well. Good, good. Now, for those of you who know Epi, we've got a pretty exciting thing to talk about here in a little bit, but let me bring on my other exciting panelists first. Jeffrey McVeigh, uh, he's a LAPS academic and a freelance world builder. How are you doing tonight, Jeffrey? I'm doing quite well. Yeah, it's pretty cold up there in the in the Great White North. I'm I'm, I'm sorry to yes, hear. Yes, yes. Now that now that you are aware of where the Great White North is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you had to give me a little map lesson, people. I'm sorry. Uh, and then, last but not least, uh, the tallest of all three panelists, if you look at just a picture of them, is <laughs> Julia Ellen Bow, who is of Stone Baby Games and the creator of the wonderful RPG Steal Away Jordan. How are you, doing, Julia? Doing well, thank you. Good, good, good. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for coming on board. Um, so let's let's kind of lead off a little bit before we get into the questions and see what do you guys think about an overall perspective? Do you use holidays in the kind of games that you've written or games that you run or play in? Is that a big part or feature of your role playing? Sure. Um, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Should we just step in? Because uh, yeah, step in, jump in. Let's, um, let's, let's just kind of fluff it up a little is, bit. There is a uh, a fun little game. Um, that, uh, I, I run a tunnels and trolls game uh, that uh, has been ongoing for several years now. That involves a lot of uh, teens uh, and uh, preteens. Um, and uh, we had a game. A very the very first time we played the game. Um, I had them stop at a toll house, which uh, immediately invoked cookies um, because that's you know toll house. And I actually um, named the owner of the toll house uh, Ruth Wakefield, who's also the woman who invented the chocolate chip cookie, which is an important name that everyone should know. <laughs> it's a tremendously important person. Um, and in this toll house, they got into a fight with a bunch of orcs and. Uh, mm -hmm immediately invented the holiday St. Mullins Day, which is a day on which if you offer uh, somebody a cookie, then they owe you a favor. And they were able to uh, work their way down from this fight with these orcs uh, to making them unsteady allies, offering them cookies. And uh, that day, St. Mullins Day, and all of the things that we've invented about that since then, it, like it's shown up on almost every single time we've played that game. Uh, it was, it, it turned out to be a tremendously important holiday that happened every, like, 13 days or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I, I do enjoy using holidays or inventing them for for what we're doing. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, Jeffrey, Julie, any uh, any notable holidays that you guys have had in your games? I tend to use seasons more. So, um, uh, let's see, Tales of the Fisherman's Wife is supposed to be set in midsummer, which is when um, ghost activity and supernatural activity is the highest. Um, I think I've made up holidays before. I have a bachelor's degree in religion, so it's, 
I, I think I think about it so much that I can't even come up with an example because it's like, oh yeah, I'll just make up this holiday and throw it in there. And so yeah, um, but I, I look at more of the seasons. So what's happening? Either are we lining it up to what's actually happening outside in real life, or if it's uh, something different? It's the dead of winter, and we want to have a summer game, maybe. Great, neat. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and that that tends to be the sort of thing that I do as well. That um, you bring in these festivals to bring out the color of the world that you're creating or that you're playing in. Um, so, and they're great for doing little thematic things in the background as you, know, you have a starving city where they're still celebrating with some sort of festival of plenty even though it's obvious that they can't afford to do it or they can't really sort of embrace the entire spirit of it and it gives, gives the players and their characters a, a chance to like, understand a little more clearly what's going on in that case. Nice, great. Well, you know, I kind of back ended into a question that Julia, uh, that Julie had asked, um, and she also has another part of her question here, which is pretty cool. Every seasonal game that I've ever played, this is Julie, uh, every game I've played has descended into complete and utter silliness. It's highly entertaining, but there are there other ways to make a festive game memorable and unique without going gonzo? Add murder. <laughs> you know, if you uh, if if you're playing a game that's supposed to be festive, of course it's going to be festive until something really bad happens, and then I don't know, then the bad thing happens. Um, otherwise, uh, I mean, there are festivals and there are, there are holidays that are uh, more somber in nature. So come up with one and have it. If you are making one up, have it be to mark something terrible that happened as opposed to, you know, a feast or a time when everybody's happy. Tragic holiday, that's a really good idea. I yes. mean, we have a lot of tragic holidays. People just kind of skim over it, but... Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's a whole category of uh, types of festivals like that. I mean, sort of purgation festivals where you're trying to you know, drive something out of the place you live. Maybe it's at the end of the year, you, know, you, you know, go off to a little you know, traditional Scottish village and see people carrying death out of the village in the form of a little doll. Or you can take the biblical scapegoat where you just load all of the sins of the community onto one thing and then get rid of it. I mean, these are not exactly happy times, but they tend to come just before the celebration. You, know, you, you get rid of the things you don't want and then that leaves you with sort of room, so to speak, um, to bring in the kind of forces that you do. So, yeah, they can go together very well. That, that actually kind of reminds me straight up of uh, Hunger Games and plots like that too where, uh, you know, or, or the, um, Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, or where the player, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking in uh, just sort of having the wandering player character kind of situation where they come into a town and they think that they're coming in for a, uh, a holiday and uh, what's going on, it turns out to be something far more sinister than what they suspect or, uh, or just their misunderstanding of it. Um, they don't I think that's a, a lovely thing to do in a game to show off. I, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, sort of providing wonder in games, which also ties really well into holidays. I, I think my favorite uh, le you know experiences in my youth of of holidays has to do with the wonders of the of those holidays, right? Like the. Uh, you know, the whole thing about um, Christmas with presents showing up out of nowhere when you you totally, you know, have to believe in that. Or um, there's the uh, sense of wonder about uh, the scary things that are going to happen on Halloween or even just the, the awe with which you watch fireworks on the 4th of July or that. 
and they're one of the neat ways to instill wonder in like uh, players is to present them with um, uh, congruent but contradictory ideas like uh, um, well, I mean, like, it, winter is full of them when you, you think about it as, like, a, uh, we think about winter holidays as being warm events when it's during the coldest time of the year. Or uh, we think about winter nights as being particularly bright, even though they're the longest nights of the year. That's because of the snow and the moon shining off it. And, um, and one of the best experiences about going somewhere and experiencing a new thing is to stumble upon the wonder of a new culture, like finding out how they deal with things or the, the different way that they may look at something as commonplaces. Uh, I'm just rattling on here. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, Epi. Um, we've got a couple of statements, not really a question even called out by a, 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 a Dymphna C. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, there's a, a notation here. Look at the Wicker Man. Um, oh, which yeah. Is, yeah, it's been a couple versions of the Wicker Man movie, but Christopher Lee in a dress and it's still not not uh, silly. It's scary. So I think that's some great little feedback. And then um, mention of the game Back and All, um, oh, yeah. which is an indie game from uh, Paul Sega. Uh, that's all about holidays, but and not at all silly. But it can descend into uh, a, a sex farce if you want it to. <laughs> That's some good well, suggestions there. <laughs> I don't want to come up with that list. <laughs> yeah, it's a dangerous area to go. Uh, well, John Lommers has a question. Do you have suggestions for using holidays to reinforce the culture of your game world rather than letting hours leak in? Um, I can, I can give a bit of advice it, on this. Have. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that I mean, it's easy to, to let things sort of leak over from our own experiences, and to some extent, we need that to happen. Otherwise, we have nothing to compare this imagined world to. We need something to be familiar so that at least when we talk about a holiday or a festival, we get a vague idea. But I think what you ought to do as, uh, as the creator of a setting is you have to step back enough to ask you know, why are these people celebrating um, you know what need for the culture or for a community within the culture does this fill for them um, you know, does it uh, help strengthen their sort of communal identity um, does it sort of acknowledge uh, their place in history you know their ancestors and so on does it of help maintain a cycle with the natural world? You know, is it a, a way of organizing labor so that harvests get done at the right time and so on? I think it's there's nothing wrong with sort of looking at bits and pieces of things that are celebrated in the real world um, so long as you're not sort of lifting them up whole cloth and especially if it's not coming out of your own culture, and then dropping them into a fantasy world. You know, as, as if to say, you know, this, this culture is just like us, but they're clearly strange and fictional because they practice, you know, Ramadan. Um, and there's, you know, it, it's a problematic kind of crossover uh, if you start doing that. I think you can use them to um, mark historical events in the world. So uh, if somebody on a particular day became a martyr or did something really great or really awful, uh, the people in your world would know that on such and such a date somebody did this thing, they did this and now we celebrate or we, we mark this day by doing X, Y, and Z. So uh, using historical events. Uh, you could, I guess, model them after um, actual events that happened in real world, but you could also make up, you know, somebody walked into the town and saved the world, and so now we mark that day every year on this particular date. Um, also, going back to seasons, when you, um, what do people eat? What, 
when do they harvest? When when is seed uh, harvest time or the most important crop that you collect? When does that happen? Um, what do people use to celebrate their holidays? Do they eat? Do they fast? Do they um, do they give gifts? Do they steal from people? Do they form bands of roving marauders who go off and <laughs> do whatever? <laughs> Yeah. Very cool. Epi, uh, mm -hmm. any suggestions for, for reinforcing cultures through holidays? Well, I think they, they got it. Um, I, I really liked what both Jeffrey and Julia had to say. Uh, also, I, I'm thinking simply about... Uh, the, the holidays that I tend to celebrate and looking at them, uh, one of the things that I, I kind of love about them is how nonsensical they are out of context as well, um, which may end up uh, falling into the silly realm here, but like uh, just the things that have grown out of holidays as the culture has moved from the original impetus for why the holiday exists uh, I, I'm I'm trying to think of some really good examples here, and I can't come up with much except that like uh, <clears throat> um, just like the the classic you know why bunnies and chocolate eggs on Easter right like n none of them have to do with uh, ostensibly what Easter is supposed to be about, and yet they're inherent to the holiday to the modern you know. Uh, uh, Participant, so I, I think that that's always fun to just throw in, just random things that have been collected over the years, uh, without any real explanation that the that anybody will be able to give anyone, right? Um, uh, I, so I just offer that. <laughs> can I can I jump in too and sure. just uh, add on to what Epi said? Um, so with Easter, the, the the rabbits and the and the eggs are pagan. Crossovers. Mm -hmm. So it, you could use you have a holiday and it's got this random thing that doesn't seem to make any sense with what you're doing. Um, so to illustrate the culture, um, you use that holiday and all those weird things that don't seem to make sense by saying, "Well, you know, our conquerors did this, and so we just kind of kept it, even though we didn't really agree or understand why." Um, so. Using using a holiday that has some incongruent little practices uh, to sort of show where this culture has been and what influences were on the culture before, during, and after you're playing. And and those would make really nice like open signifiers that let uh, the players kind of spill in their own ideas into it. Like you could just drop something like that in a game and then. Uh, if it sticks in someone's mind and they go and investigate it, you can find out what they think it might be and uh, follow that route. Uh, I, I love littering my games with things that uh, not, not necessarily are nonsensical, but like that are evocative but don't have a reason yet uh, just to see what reason people who are playing come up with, you know. Yeah, that's, that's really great. So you just kind of I throw a holiday and then let the players right. suss out what it means. It's pretty cool. Um, so the next question that we have is Marshall Miller. Uh, Marshall asks, "Why isn't there?" And hey, you know, with uh, with your <laughs> Patreon, Epi, I think this is uh, going to be issue three or four. Why isn't there a system agnostic uh, book of holidays? Not not an agnostic book of holidays. A right, system right. agnostic <laughs> book of holidays. Why isn't there one? Julia, get on there. Jeffrey, come on. <laughs> so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Do trying to understand the question. <laughs> I think it's just more of a statement question. Well, what is it there? You want what? There's like a book of a thousand one starship names. We don't have a book of holidays. What's up with that? Right, right. Ah, um, ah, ah. A good question. <laughs> there are lots uh, of calendars that have that. I, I don't know. Maybe Marshall realms. should get on yeah. that. Marshall should. Uh, he's created some stuff. So... 
He's actually even part of something we're going to talk about very soon. Is it, uh, Marshall also asks, is it appropriate to give in-game gifts for out-of-game holidays and vice versa? <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. that'd be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> How have you set that up a, to, to um, give gifts in, in, uh, in-game? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Julia. Oh, okay. Um, so I have a, a, a letter-writing game that... I'm doing with a friend of mine who lives across the country, and part of it is that our characters give gifts to each other or stuff. And so, um, on my end, I know I spend a good two months just I, I'm in a store or I'm traveling or somewhere, and I'll find a postcard or a little thing, or I'm cleaning my attic and I find something. I add to it. I write a story about it, and I send it on. Um, in some games, we've done that where they they end up as props, so. You know, like, we'll have a feast, and we actually bring food. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be food that anybody would really eat at the table, but um, in-game, they would. And food's always good when you're playing. Always, yeah. always, always good. We, I mean, if we wanted to, we could start a tradition right now. Like, set a date this day from mm-hmm. here on forth. Every character in every game levels up one level. On this day, December fourteenth, <laughs> every year, uh, and create a uh, a player holiday. That'd be fun. <laughs> on that note, I'm gonna go um, level up my oh yeah <laughs> my dinner. I will be right back. <laughs> Hold on. Ju- Julie is going to be basting her dinner. She will yes. be back very. very I'm, soon. I'm basting a tofurkey actually. Oh, lovely. Right back. Yes. Hold on. See you soon. Uh, I, yeah, I think that's this really great. Just to kind of talk about my personal experience, when I um, ran Vampire the Masquerade during college, uh, our group was pretty close, and we always had um, in-game Christmas. So that would be a separate event to where all the player <laughs> characters would would trade around, and they would there was actually a good deal of role-playing of finding the perfect gift because it would, it would be a right. one-upmanship uh, among, <laughs> among all of the politics of all the... The group and and then we would also then have an actual gift giving between the group, a little white elephant type deal. So it was it was pretty fun. It was good stuff. Um, you know what, Epi? While Julie is basting, sure. I think let's take a break from answering questions because I, I want Julie to, to weigh in on Mick Bradley's question. He came in on the Q and A as well as the other stuff okay. that we have. Tell us a little bit about Epimus. All right. So uh, Ephemus is, oh my god, I don't know how many years it's been going on now. It seems like forever. Um, but it's a, a, an annual holiday for gamers uh, in which um, a bunch of uh, indie uh, RPG publishers are trying to encourage people to give the gift of game PDFs uh, for the holidays. And uh, each year we do a different kind of promotion where you buy some game PDFs for a friend of yours, and you get them as well for yourself free of charge, right? And uh, usually the games are at a, a reduced cost. So uh, this year, it's really kind of crazy. This year, <laughs> the idea of this year is that um, chaos, the Chaos Lords have corrupted the elves around the North Pole, and uh, Epiclaus is no longer in charge and you can't actually determine which games you're going to get your friend and you're going to get yourself. It's all going to be a surprise to everyone on Epimus Morn. Um, and if you go to Epimus, that's E-P-I-M-A-S dash season dot com, uh, it'll take you to a, a little section where you fill out a survey that, that says which of these games do you and your friend already have, and you click those out, and then uh, it'll say, for $5, we'll send two random ones to your friend on Epimus Morn. Epimus Morn, by the way, is the, the morning of December 24th. Uh, I, there's a few people in the world who still don't celebrate Epimus, so they might not know that that's the actual date, but it's December 24th. <laughs> uh, and um, on December 24th, if you, if you buy uh, two gifts for uh, your friend, they will receive two random PDFs from the list of PDFs that they don't have, and you as well will list uh, will receive the same PDFs uh, on that morning. And it's five dollars for two, ten for four, fifteen for six, or thirty-five for everything. The whole tofus. 
Yeah, the whole two. We always loved that one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I would recommend, highly recommend, because I participated in Anthemus from, from the very first time that I heard about it. So I would highly recommend that you go to the website and check it out. Uh, but for those who just need a little bit more enticement, I have created a wonderful, highly expensive presentation, which just has a list of all the names of the game. So here yes. we go. Let me let me share with everybody, just to entice you a little bit more. Crap, where is it? Where is it? I have too many windows. I'm trying to do the thing. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So hopefully you oh, guys can nice. see this. Yeah, so we have Anima Prime, Bulldogs, Burning Opera. I've never even heard of Burning Opera, so I'm kind of yeah. excited about that one. Carrie. <laughs> A Game About War, The Daughters of Verona, Dirty Secrets, Dust Devil's Revenge, mm -hmm. Faith, Fortune's Fool, Full Moon, Grey Ranks, Heroin, Hot Guys Making Out, Misericordy? Misericord. Misericord. Thank you. I've never heard it pronounced. <laughs> Mis Misspent Youth, uh, Montsegur 1244, Nano World by one of the people who asked questions here, Marshall Miller. <laughs> Uh, our last best hope by Mark Diaz Truman, Piratius. <laughs> uh, pirate right? tees, I believe. Pirate like uh, <laughs> it's T and pirates. T and pirates. That's awesome. Siren, Revenant, Spark RPG, Spin the Beetle, which just came out, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Superhero Bakery, which my son participated in at Camp Nerdly, and he loved it. Thou art but a warrior. And the vast and starlit library. So that is quite a large selection of awesome games that you totally should check out. And, and Julie is back yourself. from her basting. Back from her basting. Oh, yay. <laughs> Brooklyn time. You've missed no questions, only a large commercial. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I invited Epi because I, I wanted to talk about Epi, Epi. So this is not Epi's fault. It's my fault. Bring it. Bring it to me. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's let's answer a live Q and A. This is from a buddy of mine, Mick Bradley, uh, and it has nothing to do with the game that we're going to be playing in an hour and a half. Oh. Uh, would you share some ideas about an odd festival or holiday that might be tossed into an apocalypse world campaign set in northern New York? It's a little specific, other than commemorating the day the world ended. Uh, uh, the the day you found the canned beans. I would think <laughs> that would be reason to celebrate, right? Or or, yes. or like a truck of ramen. Oh my god! Or, ramen truck day. Or truck yeah. of Cheetos. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that involves finding food in it should probably be like the shittiest, crappiest food that you right. <laughs> are in. In our world, we are embarrassed to say that we actually eat, but in the apocalypse world, perhaps people would be like, I'm freaking starving. I really love the ramen powder. <laughs> and I don't even need water. Just the ramen powder. How, uh, how weird is the apocalypse in this apocalypse world? You know, it... it hasn't been terribly weird. It's been very Road Warrior-esque. Okay, all right, yeah. yeah I'm playing a chopper. Nice. Who, who beats people and things <laughs> with pipes and a hatchet. So... Well, it could be the day that you didn't have to beat someone. That's not a holiday. <laughs> That's Tuesday. Um, Jeffrey, where are you at, man? What's some post-apocalyptic holidays for us? Right off the top of your head. All right. Um, well, if you're... This is reasonably soonish after Apocalypse. I, I only... Yeah, 50 years. Okay, 50 years. So you're couple generations down the line from people who clearly remember what the world was like. Um, you know, what are they doing these days for arts? I mean, do they have a new kind of historical storytelling tradition that also pulls things in from old television shows or old movies that people half remember and have pulled oh, together? Nice. So do you have these, these reenactments of um, things that look you know, half like an episode of Seinfeld and half like, <laughs> you know, a profound historic moment that right. uh, that they had. Or do they, they base these mythic figures on, you know, these combinations of historical and, and fictional um, parts of their past. And then just have an entire day or, you know, until death comes to them of 
um, sort of exchanging stories. And, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing that would normally happen at a larger festival, say, focused on trade or focused on, you know, arranging other exchanges like marriages and so on. Um, you know, you always, you sit down, you trade stories, and then everyone goes off their own way and spreads those stories. But, you know, off the top of my head. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. This model something after a passion play. So, yeah. you know, you do the passion yeah. play, um, which is, you know, when you think about what a passion play really is, it's a really awful event. It's just mm -hmm. about, you know, the the torture of, of the sky, and they stick them on a cross, and people say, I'm so sorry for torturing you. And uh, I guess I'm thinking of the Mel Gibson version. But, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's still a really, when you think about, I, I think about Passion Pels plays as being kind of terrible things. And then over the years, they, they do, they've sort of taken on uh, a culture's dislike of one other culture. So some Passion plays are incredibly anti Semitic, like Mel Gibson's. Um, and. You know, it's still, it's an awful event. It's marking something that, that Christians don't, that I guess Christians do celebrate in some way. The afternoon. The resurrection. Hmm. Yeah. I've only, I've played Apocalypse World quite a bit, and I've only ever had one holiday, and that was made up <laughs> by a player. Um, it was the, it was actually a sequel game. So uh, the first game ended, and then there was a giant diaspora. Uh, of a lot of the principal characters, and so the holiday created was called Reunion because it was the idea that once every season, uh, the people who had kind of broken apart would try to get together and reconnect a little bit. And I thought that was a pretty neat little idea for for Apocalypse World holiday, but it wasn't in Upper State New York, so sorry. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get back to some of the the uh, other questions that have been submitted to us as we uh, start to come to a close here. Eric Duncan. Asks uh, in games, should we differentiate between holidays and holy days? I think it depends on the game, and the yeah, it depends on the game. If you think about, but, you know, in in our in Western society, we have holy days, we have holidays. Veterans Day is, I don't know, is that a holiday? Yeah. Patriots Day in Massachusetts. <laughs> It's a sort of a holiday. Um, Christmas, for a lot of people, is a holiday. It is not a holy day. Um, so it, I, I think it depends on, on the world, just like it depends on our world. Like, we celebrate, in our house, we celebrate Christmas as sort of this time when we give gifts. And I remember growing up, we would go to Midnight Mass and really celebrated, you know, putting the Christ in Christmas and then sort of changed teams and didn't do that anymore and so now Christmas is a time when we go shopping and we watch the Lord of the Rings movies. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which we've already done but we're going to do it again on Christmas. <laughs> nice. It, yeah, it, it seems as you say, it, it depends on the world which I think in future really for any of these conversations that could just be the first answer to all <laughs> questions. Um, <laughs> But specifically, you need an idea, or you need a, a culture that is secularized to some extent. And the idea that um, you also need a certain uh, attitude towards history in general. The, you know, the, the desire to not just record history in a straight line, but you know, continue to remember specific events in the past for the secular holidays. But if you, I mean, you don't have to go back all that far in, um, you know, even European, North American history when they were essentially all holy days. Um, and, you know, whether or not people celebrated them as such even then is still debatable, but, uh, but at least they were aware of the, the meaning they were supposed to get out of it. I think there's uh, some like ripe ground for fictional strife uh, between two related cultures that may have gone two different ways with a holiday and a holy day, which may be fun to play out, right? You know, you have uh, one group that has uh, held on to its more 
spiritual roots of the the holiday and the other one that has gone off and done the more material trappings and then they come and meet back together again uh and just the clash the culture clash that can happen there there's some fun stuff to be had there i think especially if you have cultures that have separated and in their separate history one of them has had some other very important event ha happen on mm -hmm. that day you know you imagine if if Christmas Day is also Independence Day for one particular country. Yeah. The way they celebrate mm -hmm. it is going to turn into something different. They have different experiences to, to commemorate. Eric also asked, what are the three, and we can go with less than three, but three <laughs> is the best shorthand things. What are three best sh shorthand things to do to establish the tone or feel of a holiday in a game? I think food would be the first one. What do people eat? Uh, yeah. the, uh, the image. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, I, I, like that, or in like sensual details. Like, we have songs that we associate with certain holidays, obviously, and uh, uh, sometimes to the detriment of the holiday. <laughs> um, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that could be a lot of fun. I mean, it, having a, a particular song that's associated with a uh, in-game holiday and uh, give it a little flavor. Not suggesting anyone needs to write any music, but uh. and uh, that seems to connect with what Julia was saying about yeah the, the imagery um, that you want to present. I mean, is this going to be a festive song? Is this a mournful song? Um, is it something you know nationalistic or uh, one of the other or a couple of the other things that you can think of? Um, how much uh, how much leeway are people in society given at this time? Is it a carnival esque thing where all the social uh, differences are leveled out temporarily, or is it uh, something? much more structured, um, much more ritualized, where people have their roles to play for that particular day. Uh, I only bring up that one because whichever it is, if you have outside characters coming into the middle of it, mm -hmm. there's going to be some sort of clash. I mean, either they walk in when Carnival is on and everyone is ignoring the law, or they're the only people who don't know the rules on a very, very special day. In either case, you you can probably you know, burn them at the stake. <laughs> but yeah, that's my answer to everything. So. <laughs> so it depends on your world, and you can burn them at the stake. These are two <laughs> caveats to, to keep in mind for Jeffrey's games. It's, it's good to know. <laughs> just, just a thought off the top of my head, uh, color, I think, is an important part of at least a few of the major American holidays. When I think of Halloween, I'm always thinking of orange, right? And, 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 and black and white for, for skeletons and all, and scariness and stuff. And when I think of Christmas, it's green and, and red. So if you have a few major holidays, maybe the colors that, that are seen in decorations is something you can use as a quick dash uh, way to describe things. But that's for shorthand things, so sorry, Eric. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm going to jump down here because I, I like Chris Weeks. Uh, what techniques would help make holidays in fictitious worlds feel both exotic and realistic? And this may come down to kind of a GM knowing the players, but do you guys have any tips as far as how you could do that? Hmm. Well, I think about holidays that you don't celebrate that you know about. And... Uh, go beyond think you know what people are doing, but also what what is it about that holiday that you don't really understand? Uh, what do you understand? Um, why is it different from your holiday? So, uh, say Hanukkah uh, comes on Thanksgiving this year. Came on Thanksgiving this year, um, or started. Um, but not everybody was celebrating Hanukkah. Um, but it. it so it has sort of that, that exotic thing if you are not Jewish and everyone is doing just Thanksgiving, then you have people who are also doing other things for the next several days. 
Um, so think about how you react to holidays that, that no one else is celebrating or, or that only you celebrate or that people you know celebrate but you don't. Um, so for example, during the month of Ramadan, I'm the only person, I work in a food co-op, I'm the only person fasting all day. <laughs> and um, it's interesting to see people's reaction when they, they, like, I'll sit down with them and they start eating and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Um, and I know it is weird for people to know that I'm fasting, especially during the summer, all freaking day. And, uh, and, and th you know, there is that discomfort that they feel where I'm just like, well, I'm fasting and whatever. Go ahead and eat. Um, so consider how you react to people celebrating a holiday that you don't. And there you will get your, your exoticism. And then think of a holiday that you really love that has just very base elements. What is it? Is it, is it a feast? Is it a fast? Is it a celebration? Is it a morning? And I mean, that's basically what holidays, they, they're either, uh, well, they commemorate something. Um, what is your holiday going to commemorate? And who celebrates it? Who doesn't celebrate it? Who thinks it's a terrible day? Who, who thinks that you know Columbus Day is a day that is is not to celebrate Christopher Columbus discovering America? <laughs> um, and go from there. I think I would I would go back to the point that Happy made early on about finding. Elements that are congruent, elements that fit in with the world, but are still unexplained, or just feel a little bit out of place. If you want that that sense of exoticism, um, I mean, I, <clears throat> my general rule when dealing with anything religious and world building is, you know, make it messy. Make sure that there are bits that just don't seem to fit anywhere, and uh, and the you know, getting that exotic feeling for holidays that's still realistic. We can still pull out you know, loads of real-world examples of, of similar um, incongruities. And, uh, you know, I, I think if you just work with that and work with the idea that you don't have to explain everything, you don't have to unpack every bit of symbolism, then, uh, then you should be good. <laughs> Any closing thoughts on that one, Epi? It's okay. I, uh, well, I, I agree with both. I, 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 um, I, yeah, I would say that, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but Jeffrey agreed with me, so I'm going to stick by my point there. That's <laughs> say yes, I agree with that as well. And you agree uh, with Jeffrey, agree with you. That's yeah, smart. and uh, yeah, just the the idea of. Um, giving the players little details to hook their imaginations on, right? Um, if if you walk into a house and uh, on three days in a row and on the third day they all have little homemade dolls sitting at the table settings and none of them are eating, uh, that's going to... Uh, who's not going to try and figure out what that's all about, right? Like, that's... and. In real life, you it would be awkward. You'd be like, um, I don't. Uh, can I ask? Is this something I should know? Am I violating some sort of social thing? But player characters are a little bit sociopathic, so they they have no problem stepping in. And, <laughs> often to people's betterment. I mean, like a lot of times they'll just walk up to a person and ask what the problem is and how they can fix it. But in in this case, you know, they'll just. Uh, so if you just add, throw in details like that, I think it, it hooks the players, and that's the first thing you want to do. You want to uh, just get them interested in figuring out what's going on, even if there's no real answer behind it. I'm going to start sounding like J.J. Abrams now, and I don't want to do that, so I'll stop there. <laughs> years and years ago. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to make the joke, are you getting a little lost? But uh, uh, um, years and years ago, when I uh, my first year in college, um, we were doing this. What was it was sort of like this multicultural thing, even though it was all for the students of color who were coming into a predominantly white college. Um, and 
So they had us go through this thing, and I guess it was so that we could see what it was like to be the other, um, which is really helpful if you're <laughs> a person of color. <laughs> and um, but it was—I I don't mean to diss it. It was actually a really good program. Um, so we had this one thing where we were supposed to. Uh, they, they did this thing where we were not supposed to talk, and they had us go through all these little things where we were approaching a culture that we didn't understand. First thing we had to do was take our shoes off, but they couldn't tell us that we had to take our shoes off because they were pretending that we couldn't understand each other. Right? So we somehow managed to get our shoes off. Then we were supposed to be doing this kind of feast thing. Um, and and it, was, it was intentionally foreign to everybody. Um, my biggest memory of that was that they handed me all these cherry tomatoes that I was supposed to eat, and they were making me eat them, except I really hate fresh tomatoes. So I was stuffing tomatoes in my mouth and just going, what is that? <laughs> Why am I doing this? And I, I guess that was what they were trying to achieve. And afterwards, when they said, so what did you guys think of this? And I spit all the tomatoes out. And I said, I thought that the tomatoes were awful. And everybody else was like, well, I was so glad that you gave me tomatoes. And then they said, well, you know, the tomatoes weren't necessarily, like offering you food wasn't necessarily a gesture of kindness. And I was like, yeah, I, I totally got that, <laughs> given my dislike of tomatoes. Um, so I, I, just to wrap that back and sort of, you know, presenting something foreign, like the dolls at the table where you don't know why they're there. Um, and it, it's sort of familiar, but it's not familiar. Okay, we, we know we eat, but why mm -hmm. are the dolls the ones who seem to be getting the food and no one else who actually would eat gets the food? Ouch. That's awesome. <laughs> I've never used this holiday, um, but you guys talking about it, it's kind of brought to mind. I don't know if you guys uh, or if anyone out in the YouTube land has ever watched the amazing sci-fi television show called Babylon 5. Mm -hmm. um, but in the fifth season of Babylon 5, there was an episode called The Day of the Dead. And in that episode, there was a particular event where during one day, the dead literally came back to visit several of the principal characters. And um, there were some enemies and some friends and lovers who all came back. And it was brilliant. It was really, really awesome. Um, and in a fantastic world, I think that could be a super spicy holiday to throw in. Um, hey, you you killed this big bad guy. Well, he's he's dead, but guess what? Day of the Dead, he gets to come back. And they and they, <laughs> they didn't like punch and get in fights or anything, but just imagine that conversation. I think that could be really awesome. So. But I mean, that's something that's available to us too. Is like uh, taking uh, before when I spoke about how the uh, my sense of the holidays in my youth being about wonder, a lot of that had to do with, you know, my parents lying to me, right? <laughs> and saying, this is what's happening, and I'm just eating it, uh, whatever they're saying. Um, but, you know, if we have a fantasy world, if we have a world where we can make it actually true, and we can make it happen, then there's things that we can do uh, to shed light on. Uh, one of the jokes that keeps resurfacing a lot in uh, whenever we do Epimus every year about Epiclaus is just about how terrifying Santa Claus actually would be. If, 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 if there was this person with this access to your household, like, sure, yeah, he's got the best of intentions, but, like, so does the NSA, right? Like, or technically. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody's comfortable with that, except me. I'm very comfortable with that. And just in case they're watching. Um, so, like, uh, there's there's fun things to be done where you take a look at uh, some of the things that we tell children that are possible on certain holidays and um, follow, the, follow through on them, make them happen. That's a good point. That's good. That's good. All right, well, uh, we have gone through all of the questions that were posed to the panel. We have solved all tabletop role-playing <laughs> game questions about festivals yeah. and holidays. Thank you, Epi. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Julia, for solving all of those problems and questions. <laughs> um, I, I'd just like to take just a moment to, if, for people who want to know a little bit more about each of you, if you could, um, just talk a little about where can we find out more information about you and what kind of stuff do you have on the horizon? Um, who wants to kind of lead off? 
Don't make me call on you. <laughs> I'll go with Epi. All Epi. right. So where can people find out more about what you're up to? Um, you can go to digathousandholes.com. That's my uh, publishing website. I'm the only Epidia in the world, so if you search for that, you'll find me. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not. There, I think there's a, a few others that show up, but um, probably the more prominent one there. So, uh, And also, if you look for Worlds Without Master, that's uh, the new project of mine, which is a um, bi-monthly so far, e-zine of sword and sorcery fiction and gaming and comics and illustrations, and I'm funding it through Patreon, which... Uh, uh, is a sort of a crowdfunding website that does something similar to a subscription service. It's not exactly a subscription service because you don't pay until something's delivered, uh, which is very helpful for me on my end. Then I don't feel the stress of having all your money and not having delivered anything. So, um, and uh, and I'm doing Epimus. So uh, Epimus uh, E P I M A S dash season dot com. Uh, you can go buy games for friends, get surprise games for yourself, uh, and terrify yourself on Ep- Epimus Morn. <laughs> That's what I'm up to. Thanks, Epi. Uh, Jeffrey, wh- where can we find out more about you, sir? Uh, easiest way to do it is uh, really just through Google+. I mean, I'm, I'm social. I will chat with people and hand out unwanted advice or <laughs> cat pictures uh, as requested. <laughs> Oh, um, you had me at advice. You lost me a cat picture. Oh. <laughs> it's all right. I, I do try to keep out the riffraff. Um, <laughs> as for things that I'm doing these days, um, working on, I guess, part of the new version or newer version of Vampire Dark Ages for Onyx Path Publishing. Um, get to rewrite the Tremere and fix a lot of Latin. <laughs> and other than that, yeah, just sort of bits and pieces. So, um, generally doing the standard Canadian winter thing, you know, avoiding <laughs> possession by the Wendigo. But, uh, <laughs> it's just don't eat people, right? That, that's all you've got to do. Trickier <laughs> than you think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Julia, how can people stalk you or find out more about the stuff that you do? Um, right now, uh, Google Plus is probably the easiest. Um, I'm also on Facebook, and I, I post a lot of selfies on Instagram. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a website, but I have not I have not cared or fed it recently, um, like in about a year and a half. So probably Google Plus is the easiest. And what I'm doing next, I I have um, I have a full time job that I've had for almost a year that I talk a lot about uh, on Google Plus and it's crazy making and it's really very rewarding but crazy making. Um, So I'm postponing and uh, procrastinating Tales of the Fisherman's Wife for more time and um, doing LARPs. So uh, my next, I'm co-writing a LARP with Kat Jones which we will have at Intercom in Chelmsford, Mass uh, in March. And if you really, really want to get in touch with me, you can always come into Franklin Community Cooperative in Greenfield, Massachusetts, and I'm probably upstairs. I just want to say, because I think it's amusing, that the latest post on Stone Baby Games is for Epimus. <laughs> from last year. From last year, Last yeah. exactly a year. Well, uh, yeah. There is that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks to all three of you for participating and being panelists on this. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope all of you guys enjoy your holidays. And to everyone yeah, out there, uh, everyone out there who's watching, you know, any feedback, uh, likes, subscribe to the YouTube channel, give us feedback. Uh, you know, we're looking at 2014 and what we're going to be doing in the next year as part of the game night and Indie Plus. So any feedback you have, we would very much appreciate it. So thank you, everyone, and have an excellent evening. You yeah. too. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good night.